Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. And with me today is Aaron Hay, production designer of The Stand, the new limited series on Paramount Plus, latest adaptation of Stephen King's classic epic novel. Uh, and Aaron, actually, before I jump into directly The Stand, I noticed, you know, on your resume, you actually have a background in model making uh, from Industrial Light and Magic. And you have such a, a wide ranging uh, list of projects there that you've worked on, uh, really classic films. And I, I'm wondering what did you take from that experience there in terms of this model making and what was most valuable from that going into work as a production designer? Oops, sorry, you're on mute, Aaron. Sorry about that. That's All fine. of those, uh, so those early, early years of my career, I spent uh, in visual effects uh, doing model building and, and uh, at Industrial Light and Magic. And um, that was just an experience that brought all these different people with all these different skill sets um, to the table. Um, and I, I, I felt like just an incredible learning experience working with the, that particular group of people at that time in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. And that definitely informed everything I've done since then because it was a, um, the kind of place uh, where you have to, you have to come up, you have to find novel solutions to problems every day. Uh, it's something different all the time um, without spinning out and getting stressed out. And I feel like that's one of the things that I've taken with me over the years is to try to, um, whenever something crazy come, gets thrown at us, you just try to bend with it and, and uh, not, not break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if that, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Absolutely. And this project, The Stand, is also, I think, unique for you because, again, you've worked on so many films like Men in Black, AI, uh, the Star Wars prequels, but this is your first foray, I believe, into long-form storytelling right. in a limited yeah. series, and it's nine hours. Um, so how does that compare for you uh, versus making a film? I actually, I was really intrigued by the idea when, it, when it, they first approached me to do it. Um, at first, I wasn't sure because I'm, I'm so used to doing film, but really the idea of being able to tell a story over a longer period of time was definitely exciting for me. And um, uh, the filmmakers, the, the showrunners were, you know, so enthusiastic about the project and everybody we brought on board was so enthusiastic that it was really, um, it was really exciting to, to try to interpret King's crazy, grandiose story into, um, into a, distill it into something that's that still honors the original story, which is more than 40 years old now, I guess, and, and uh, to uh, you know, bring it into contemporary time, you know? So yeah. there was, that was, um, that was you know, exciting. And I, I, again, I feel like that long form offers us um, uh, new challenges, but really opportunities to tell bigger stories. And I think it's super exciting. Well, it's certainly, uh, it's definitely big because I think it's Stephen King's longest novel. Um, yeah. And I always wonder, is it useful for you? Do you enjoy having uh, like an adaptation? You have a book as a reference point. It's actually not the first miniseries made off of the stand. Um, so there's also that. Is there, do you like having those things to go back to, uh, mm. to take inspiration from? Or is that actually a challenge to sort of, how do I do this faithfully? I mean, it's, it's both. I mean, the book was always right there with me. Um, and I actually referred to the graphic novel quite a bit um, because um, the, the, the showrunners definitely used that in their inspiration. A lot of the art that came from those early King um, uh, illustrations the, for the books and the novel, uh, the graphic novel. Um, and, uh, but I actually, I told myself I wasn't gonna watch the miniseries. I did not want to be informed by that. Um, and that was, uh, that was intentional. It's sort of, I, I, when we kicked off the, the show, there was a kickoff party at a, at a bar or a pub up in Vancouver and, and uh, they were playing that in the background. And I was like, no, I, gotta, I can't look. I don't wanna see, I don't wanna see what they did. Um, but um, just because we really wanted this story to be fresh and contemporary and um, as much as possible, um, honor what, what the original source material was. And obviously we diverged in some places where uh, the story required it or whether, you know, circumstances and budgets and everything else required it. We always find a way. Um, but uh, so you, you use that source material, try to honor it and then move forward with, with um, the new story. Yeah. Uh, well, in this story, I think one of the most impressive uh, gigantic 
sets and locations for this one is New Vegas, mm. which, you know, in Stephen King's version of the apocalypse, that's where the evil Randall Flagg uh, calls his home base, taking over Las Vegas. And it's, uh, I, I would just love you to talk on what was your sort of overall concept for, for that location. Yeah. Um, well, we had, that one was obviously one of our biggest challenges from the beginning. We talked about all the different options we might be able to do. We looked at, we went and scouted lots of casinos in Vegas just to get a feeling for it. And as it was originally written, you know, it was meant to be, basically, I think King wrote it outside. All those things happened like on the street, on the strip, just outside the MGM Grand. And, and we first conceptualized it like that. We talked about building a very big exterior set. Um, and set extensions and and um, you know so we could have hundreds of people outside and but what it what that meant was we would have multiple locations because we couldn't service the entire story in that one place it just wouldn't sort of make sense um, and we looked at some casinos in uh, British Columbia that we could potentially close down but it would be this much you know mm. um, and very expensive and we wouldn't be able to get that much scope out of it and. Uh, I was really, there was no stage available big enough to build what we had hoped we, we knew we needed for that. Um, and then uh, at some point, this, this old hotel uh, opened up as a potential shooting site. I went and scouted it and thought, well, this is, this is amazing. It's got all this, this space we could build in. We can tear everything that's in here out and start from scratch and build whatever world we want. Um, and so that was sort of our, our concept. We really wanted to make this place in fact they called it the inferno casino eventually that was the name that we we came to but that sort of came later it was really that the you know dante's inferno was a big inspiration from the beginning there's the rings that we fall through um and the, the the different levels so that you have sort of the um uh the lowest members of society at the bottom the middle level you know as you as you work your way up until you get to the upper echelons and then finally um flag at the very penthouse of this building. So it was it was conceptualized that way as this sort of uh, stratification of society um, mm -hmm. in a very sort of visual way. Um, and then later on, the, the showrunners decided that we'll just call it Inferno. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it uh, it actually worked out. Um, but so it was a we tried to make it as high concept as we could in this in this space, which was it was a bit, the space was awkward in that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't exactly what I would have built from scratch, but it allowed us to build so much into it and be able to go from an exterior. We built a partial exterior so we could drive, you know, um, Trash's little car in through the outside and have people run out the door onto the strip, through the front doors, into this lobby, see the elevator that we got to actually work, build new, everything new inside of there, build this whole bar and casino area the gladiator pits, then build in um, Lloyd's suite. Um, and finally, you know, that was a separate set, um, uh, Flag's uh, penthouse, but everything else was all within this one area so that you could actually shoot continuously. And that was sort of the concept that we could shoot continuously from, uh, from the basement levels where the bodies were being disposed of through the gladiator pits, all the way up through the, the lobby and the, and the casino floor to Lloyd's penthouse or Lloyd's suite all in one. And that was really sort of uh, a, a really a goal for, for us to be able to do that. And, and I hope that it sort of came off that way, that it was a it was a massive sort of all in one build. Yeah, it is massive. What I, I, I love about that interior space is that it's so massive and yet there's tons of nooks and crannies everywhere. Mm. Um, so you really get delineation of, you know, different sex, uh, different classes, uh, yeah. like you were talking about. Is that where that concept came from? How do you sort of take a massive space like that and give it character? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. We sort of went, all right, we knew that there was meant to be these gladiator pits in the story. And, and so proposed that we put it in the, in the swimming pool that allowed us to sort of focus people around it. And initially, um, you know, that was, that was the basis that if we started there and worked our way up, we could really create a, a caste system within the, um, within New Vegas society um, with, with sort of Lloyd at the top um, in that sort of human side and then flag obviously in his own level. Um, and that, it, it just allowed us um, a tremendous amount of, I, I sometimes find that being put into a box is it actually allows you a great deal of freedom because once you have the box, 
you say, all right, let's let's do everything we can with this. Let's find the let's find the colors and palettes that we want. Let's let's find these images. So if you look carefully in the background, you'll see big murals on some walls that have, for instance, the Garden of Earthly Delights or some other early um, Bosch and other sort of um, uh, old, uh, very bizarre art on the walls. And we had um, little shops. Uh, um, there was these rooms with sex swings and all sorts of bizarre activities. Um, and as you say, nooks and crannies, we tried to fill every nook and cranny with a with a story, and that's really what we were trying to do: is tell the story. And in fact, it was a—it's uh, a subtle detail, but the the statuary that that lined the the gladiator pit is actually telling a story as well. Those were sort of there's a man and a woman that were classical sculptures that we then took and modified so that they have gold protruding and, and becoming. They're basically being absorbed by gold, and as you go along, the um, these little gold cubes start to take parts of their body away. And as you go along the edge of the gladiator pit, they end up just rubble and gold. So all that's left is, so it speaks to, you know, the, the nature of a post uh, industrial capitalist society. And <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, fun things like that. We tried to, we tried to fill, um, fill that space with messaging, you know, as much as we could. Yeah, that sort of reminds me, I talked to Jake Braver from the yeah. VFX team and, he was talking about that casino, uh, you know, because it has this big glass pillar kind of coming out of it where flag is at the top uh, in his penthouse. And he was, he described it as parasitic architecture. Yes, that's correct. Is that accurate yeah. to you? Yeah. So, and Jake, Jake and I worked hand in hand from the beginning on, on everything on that. Um, uh, the original concept for that was um, exactly parasitic architecture. There's an architect that, that has done that very well um, over the years. And I had seen a uh, I was inspired by a museum in Dresden, Germany, uh, designed by Daniel Liebeskind, who, who just created this, this spire going through ancient architecture or, or you know, classical architecture. And um, so the idea there was that um, you had an old Vegas casino, which is, in our instance, the Planet Hollywood building. They had given us permission to, to shoot there. And so the idea, rather than replace it, let's, let's make it feel like there's almost like the same way that the flag inserts himself into vulnerable people. We wanted to insert this parasitic architecture into the, this vulnerable casino, basically. And, uh, and so flag becomes the pinnacle and you have this stratification of society below, um, really gives you the opportunity. Uh, there was also a lot of things that, you know, as, as Jake and I were, and the, the rest of the team were sort of looking at, at how, what is New Vegas gonna look like? How do you make the strip look like the strip when most of the city is dark. Um, and uh, so that became really interesting to sort of just light specific parts of, this, of the strip. And that was really Jake and the VFX team um, who made that work for us uh, really beautifully. Um, well, as a, another set piece you created was New York. And as a New Yorker, I always love uh, seeing the different ways filmmakers destroy my city in various places. <laughs> uh, so, do you, it's just so it's just so available to destroy. Right. <laughs> There's so many things to to take down. Yeah. Um, is it how does that compare for you? Like with New Vegas, you're creating like a new uh, space, a fictional space of those interiors and stuff. Versus New York has so many iconic things, like when they're walking over the bridge um, or yeah. in Central Park. How did you uh, approach sort of the deterioration of New York? And is that uh, a harder or easier thing for you working with real life spaces? That was one of the first things we had to do. That We had a little bit of luxury of time for the, um, uh, the casino that sort of came later in the schedule. So I was able to spend a lot of time building that. But New York came up um, pretty quickly. And, um, and so we had, to, we had to really plan a, a great deal for that to try and figure out how are we gonna get the scope of New York City knowing that we'd only be able to shoot there in a limited capacity. So we, we knew Jake would be able to take a, a unit to New York and get plates and perhaps get some doubles there, um, uh, but we wouldn't be able to take our principal cast. Um, so we had to find a location that would give us some of the, the street level detail of New York City um, and build out you know, the, the basic infrastructure of New York, put in the subways and the, and the uh, you know, um, falafel carts and all the things that sort of feel uh, feel like they they uh, might belong there. Um, 
but we, so we ended up closing down um, sort of four square blocks of uh, downtown Vancouver over a weekend and um, just had a mad dash dressing through the night um, uh, to get it ready um, and uh, plotted out a plan so that we could, we went there multiple times to find out what, what views can we look in, what directions are going to work for us and actually feel like New York, where do we lose uh, where do we lose it to Vancouver and how can visual effects help us? Because obviously they're going to need to give us Fifth Avenue because we uh, we don't want to, yeah, <laughs> we don't want to see uh, Vancouver uh, in the background. Um, uh, and so we we really plotted out a, a course through there to, to, to make it feel um, as tight as we could. Um, and we were also struck with the limitation of, you know, if you know the original story, um, the escape was through the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, and that's just a massive undertaking and one that we were considering for quite a long time. We had in the early days of this, this project, um, we considered building uh, a Lincoln Tunnel, which would have been absolutely enormous and take up a huge amount of, of stage space and money and resources that we had to be smart about it. And we were striking out finding any sort of tunnel that would accommodate as a location. Um, so walking around scouting one day with the showrunners, um, I just pitched the idea of, of sort of transposing the whole sequence to a sewer um, so that we could have the claustrophobia of darkness and bodies and everything um, while um, actually sort of being able to contain it and make it even more intimate. Um, and so they sort of loved that idea and went back and wrote the scene um, and, uh, and we built, um, a big set to accommodate that. We built a 180 feet of, of meandering sewer tunnel within it and built a tank around that so we could flood it to various levels and have all these different corridors and everything. And, uh, uh, really sort of try to, try to, to give you a feeling of New York and, you know, uh, and the the entrance and the exit are a bit of a, uh, a bit of a stretch in terms of the, uh, the geography, but, um, you know, as a New Yorker, you would you would probably not want to go in a sewer tunnel from Midtown to uh, the uh, to the bridge up there. But um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but it worked in our story. Yeah. Um, well, before I let you go, I did want to just kind of ask about your philosophy and what kind of draws you to this work because I mm. you've worked on a lot of um, sci-fi projects, a lot of projects that have their really their own rich world to them. So when you, what sort of draws you to a new project and gets your creative juices flowing? Uh, I mean, I love, I love building worlds in whatever capacity that is, you know, in a, in a, in a small intimate drama or a period, you know, drama, you're building historical representations of a world in a, in a sci-fi you get to sort of blue sky, create a whole new world, which is so fun. But it's really about creating a, a canvas, an environment for the actors to feel immersed in a world. That's my goal: is to have have an actor walk onto a set and feel like they belong there. You know, um, and that's that's always the greatest um, compliment um, when when someone um, when an actor says, you know, thank you so much. Like I was I was there. You know, um, or you you know you gave us the canvas and and you know. So really that's, that's my, my philosophy is that we just, we're here to support a story, uh, a narrative and to support the actors in whatever way we can and find a way to allow the, the, um, you know, the, the DP and the director and everybody, all the other storytellers to really, you know, give them, give them something to shoot into that, that just supports a story. Um, and um, that's, that's a world that I just, I, I, I love playing in and I feel so fortunate to have spent, you know, the last 25 years in some capacity um, in this playground, you know, yeah. um, so <laughs> it's, well, uh, it's a blast. Yeah, it was a great world created here for the stand and we can't wait to see what world you create next. So fantastic. I appreciate it. I've been uh, spending the last year in an animated feature and can't wait for that to come out in a couple more years. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Can't wait. Yeah. Well, All everyone right. who's out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep in touch with us throughout the season. And Aaron, thank you once again for sitting down with me. Pleasure to meet you and you do well. Mm -hmm.